The Premio Paganini International Violin Competition is known for its high standards. It does not award a first prize unless the jury has found a worthy winner. In 2015, the competition awarded a first prize for the first time in nine years for the violinist Im Mo Yang. Yang also won prizes for the youngest finalist, Best Performance of Contemporary Piece, and Best Audience Appreciation. It sure was his year. The Boston Globe praised Yang for his seamless technique and a tender warmth of tone, combined with an ability to project an engaging sense of inner sincerity through his playing. Yang has been a musical prodigy ever since he first picked up the instrument at the age of five, and now having enrolled in the New England Conservatory's renowned Artist Diploma program, he has properly begun his performing career. Yang has also been selected for Kumo Art Hall's 2018 Artist Residency. The prestigious residency program selects only one promising young artist for a year-long engagement. As a result, we've seen more of him both in and out of Korea, with his debut album coming out in November. There's little doubt that Im Mo Yang is the next big thing. Having surprised the classical music world with amazing virtuosity in technique, he is now adding depth to his artistry. The interview meets this rising superstar to share his dreams and passion. He's been quoted as one of the new generation's most talented young string virtuosi. I'm sitting down with award-winning Korean violinist Im Mo Yang today. Welcome to our program. It's great to have you. Thank you for having me. Glad to be mm. here. Now you are hugely popular in and around Korea. Now some people have even drawn a parallel between you as violinist and Jo Sung Jin as pianist. <laughs> What do you think about your popularity and your fandom? I'm glad that. Two young Korean musicians are doing so well in the classical music world. I think it shows that not only are we good at K-pop, but also classical music. Mm. So I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Right now, you are busy uh, performing in many parts of the world, and now you find yourself here in Korea as well. Tell us about your whirlwind of, of tours and uh, performances. Yeah, my album just came out, so now I'm focusing mainly on uh, promoting my album here in Korea. Mm -hmm. I recorded 24 Caprices by Paganini, and um, in fact, I just played all of them again in Genoa. Hmm. I think it was last week, and um, yeah, I've been playing here and there, but I'm most excited to be here and uh, communicate with the uh, Korean audience. All right, and now you made your mark back in 2015 by winning the 54th International Violin Competition, the Premier Paganini in Genoa, Italy. That yeah. was a huge deal back then as well. And it was the first time in nine years that the judges um, gave the first prize. Mm. Now tell us about that and your general experience with the competition. I've always been uh, wanting to You know, participate in that competition, and I'm so lucky to have won it. I've said it many times before, but Paganini has meant a lot for me from a very young age. So a competition that commemorates this composer uh, mm. also means a lot to me. And um, I think by winning this competition, my life has changed completely. Uh, I've been performing a lot more. I've been communicating with you know, different audiences. Mm. And so, yeah, it was really a life changer for me. What does it mean that they, the jury gave the first prize for the first time in nine years? Had there not been the first prize before? I think it means no one was good enough to receive the first prize. Until you came along. <laughs> All right, good for you. Now, what do you think set you apart from other contestants? Um, you should ask the jurors instead of me. <laughs> But, um, I can say that while many people avoid playing Paganini's music, I like his music. I like playing his music. It is technically demanding, but I think, you know, one of my first impressions um, of classical music was um, a recording of the 24 Caprices uh, played by Shlomo Mintz. Mm. I was given the recording when I was seven by my aunt, I think. And from that moment, I fell in love with the virtuosity that his music can convey. So I never thought Paganini as my enemy. 
I was able to prepare the competition with much ease instead of um, anxiety. Mm. And as part of the award package, you had the honor of playing with Paganini's own violin. Right. I'm sure it was a dream come true for you, for mm. any violinist, in fact. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, I think it was a rather spiritual experience for me. Um, I remember getting to the venue and um, the instrument is locked in a vault. They keep wow. in a vault because mm. they, they value so much. Sure. Um, and I don't think they open it very often. I think they open it uh, only when there is a first prize winner mm. of the competition or, you know, some famous violinist, you know, when they visit, they sure. sometimes open it. Did you follow them into the vault when they opened it? Yeah, I was right there. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, they handed to me the violin. Um, and uh, I think a luthier had to change the strings and made some adjustments for me. Mm -hmm. And the first time I played on it, I, you know, it actually didn't sound that good because the instrument hadn't been played for a while. Uh -huh. So I had to open up the sound a little bit. Um, but yeah, as I practiced, I had four hours of practice time uh -huh. because the insurance was so high. And I, I had to give a concert with that instrument in the evening. Uh -huh. I totally understand why people gave, uh, or Paganini gave the instrument a nickname, the, the Canon. Mm. because the instrument had a huge sound and um, it was very colorful. So I, I had never played on an instrument that good and it still is a, a very special experience for me. Mm. Tell us about the process of getting to know the instrument and getting warming up to the instrument. This instrument is a Guarneri del Gesù. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the greatest instruments in the world. I think it was uh, made in the mid-1700s. Mm -hmm. And it was Paganini's favorite instrument. This instrument was like a, a sports car to me. Wow. Um, it could handle anything I could do on the instrument. Mm. I could really dig into the sound and the sound won't crash. I think for me it was a, an experience to kind of experiment with different sounds. Mm. Um, but I think in general it had a very manly, dark, uh, powerful quality. Wow. How did you feel when you had to return it after your performance? Well, I'm just glad that the violin wasn't damaged at all. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. it was a very precious uh, piece of instrument. Yeah, in fact, there were four security guards standing right behind me when I played. <laughs> so they were pretty serious about keeping their instruments I'm safe. sure they mm -hmm. were. Now, you now have an interesting nickname. Yeah. Uh, people call you, and this is dubbed by your fans, and yeah. they call yeah. you In Monini, yeah. <laughs> named yeah. after Paganini, I suppose. Yeah. How do you feel yeah. about it? I absolutely love it. I yeah. think it's it's cute, I think it's witty. Um, I think my fans give me the best nicknames. Yeah. <laughs> Have you had other nicknames called? Um, not as good as this one. No. I mean, and not related to my, you know, violent playing. Mm. So. How has the competition, winning the competition, changed mm. your life? I think the first change um, was that I felt more responsibility because now uh, a lot more people got to know me and my playing. So I felt a kind of responsibility to be the best musicians I can. Um, and um, other than that, I mean, people want to have lunch with me, and, <laughs> you know, uh, a friends who never contacted me, you know, texted me all of a sudden. But um, I think it, it's very important to have a title so that you can have something to show to other people. Uh, sure. That's how you sell these days. Mm -hmm. And I'm very fond of the title because mm -hmm. Paganini has been a big part of my life anyway. Right. Yeah. At the same time, Paganini's works are known to be one of the most technically difficult for a violin. Mm. Would you agree that it's one of the, the most challenging uh, pieces to, to play? Yes, it definitely is one of the most technically challenging uh, works. But mm. when I prepared this uh, album, I realized that there's so much more than show, showing technique mm -hmm. in playing these caprices. Uh, I think there are emotions that we can explore. Uh, it's not just about showing off skills. But I think this man had a lot more to share, um, a rather humanistic side. Sure. Uh, hmm. yeah. oh, how do you mean by that? Because competitions and auditions require Paganini 
this music so much. People fixate on not making mistakes when mm. they play Paganini's music. And that's a pity because I think when you don't have to play for jurors, you begin to see a lot more than uh, the notes. Mm. And yeah, I think his music can be played in a lot of different ways. You know, since he was a celebrity of his time, I think he knew what he was communicating with his audience. Mm. So in that respect, I think it would be a pity to just, you know, practice the notes and not uh, look further than that. Mm. It's very technically challenging, even as an audience member just watching you play it. It's very, very difficult, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, beyond the technique, though, I'm sure you had your own unique musical approach to mm. his works. Mm. I think... Well, virtuosity is obvious, obviously a big part of um, the image that his music gives. But I, I try to differentiate, you know, diversify uh, the virtuosity. Mm -hmm. I think there can be many versions of it. Uh, sometimes he can be a great joker. So I, I try to grasp the little things that he sort of planted in his music. Mm. I think by you know, focusing on those aspects that the music becomes more rich and meaningful. Mm. Now tell our viewers who may not be familiar with the 24 Caprices right. what it is. I should mention that first. Right. So he wrote this, um, we don't know exactly when he wrote it, but it's his first opus and it's a 24 little pieces that showcase, you know, violinistic skills. And to this day, we really don't know why he wrote it. There's no uh, evidence that he played it, um, the whole thing, for the public. Mm. And that interests me because he was a great violinist before composer. Mm -hmm. He would write music for himself to play. But um, these pieces that frustrate a lot of violinists today actually didn't get played in his time by the composer. Wow. So I speculate that he wrote it for himself, um, but it has been, you know, more like a Bible of violin playing mm. and you know no violinist can avoid it these days <laughs> it's a, like a coming of age you must tackle this huh as a violinist yeah something and as i said it's through. it's required you know at auditions um, so you, you have to face it as a violinist. Until you master it, you don't really get there as a violinist. Am, am I correct in understanding? Yeah, I think as? when you're able to play all of them, you'll feel like you've achieved something. You've wow. kind of stepped it up. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you have. And congratulations on that. <laughs> now, your album is called uh, 24 Caprices as yeah. well. Now, so tell us about your relationship with the pieces and yourself and your first ever album too. Mm. Yeah, I'm very proud that I recorded these 24 Caprices uh, as my first album. Um, when I started this project, at first I was, I had doubts, I had worries because it's a big project. It's also physically demanding. Mm. It, it, I think it took two hours to get through all of those pieces. Wow. Um, and it was recorded live. That was the most daunting. There was also an audience and a microphone in front of me. And I didn't quite know where to focus at first. I think within the process of preparing this album, I realized that his music is worth conveying. Uh, because I didn't have that conviction before. Mm. We um, regard these pieces as etudes or you know, practice pieces sometimes. But I'm certain now that um, it's worth communicating, and it did, I, as far as I can tell. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's a live recording, and I'm very proud because there is an element of the live recording that's embedded in this recording. Um, so I, I would have played very differently if it was a studio recording. Mm. But you know, you could hear my breath or my um, stumping, it's just not very <laughs> desirable. But um, all those little elements add up to the feel of, you know. I'm sure it recording. would feel like you're actually, you are actually in front of the audience playing yeah. once you listen to this, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just got to listen to all of it again a mm. few days ago. And um, after the last Caprice, uh, you can hear the applause <laughs> and you know I didn't even know that 
it was it was live and um, it's a very special feeling mm. to have as an artist. Yeah. Like you said, these pieces are very challenging for any violinist right. to play. Are you the type of person, uh, as a musician and as a just a person who likes challenges and musical challenges? I always want to do something new and I want to find meanings. Um, I ask myself, you know, there are tons of other Paganini Caprices recordings. Uh, why bother to add one more? And I had to answer that question for myself. Mm. That's a challenge for me. E um, even if I am playing the same piece again, I want to show something, you know, other than what I did before. And I think that's an important attitude to have as a young artist. What do you think your version of 24 Caprices how do you think it adds to the many collections of 24 caprices that are played by many mm. um, talented violinists out there? Yeah, as I said, the fact that it's a live recording um, really matters because among the countless recordings of this piece, um, there's only a few live recordings. Mm. And yeah, there is definitely something that comes across as, oh, this is you know, not a static studio setup. Um, and I think a, a sense of communication is also there because I try to play for the audience who was at the scene. Mm. So I think that makes a difference. This winter, following the release of his debut album, Yang is doing more to reach out to his fans. Recitals and fan meetings are his way of making up for the time when he was studying abroad far away from his Korean fans. To give a classical music showcase in such an open space for the public is not an insignificant challenge for the artist. It's a sign of commitment on Yang's part to reach out to his supporters. <laughs> Having played in a long list of international competitions and won many of them, Yang is hardly short of anecdotes. Cluster Center in a concourse, I was a sir, Togire, Don Song, and a sir, Locodno. The Kusong, eh, Pakchiga Sarasso, Pinevsky, Gogahu, Sunday, Pakchis Hemariga Daradanigo. <laughs> Between answering questions from his fans, Yang also gave a surprise performance. Instagram. Thank <laughs> you. 
So how did you first begin to play the violin? How did it all begin for you? Um, that's a mystery. I, mm. was, I was five years old. I wish I had a better, better memory of it. But I asked my mom and she said, um, she was the one who brought me to uh, an instrument shop near our apartment. Mm -hmm. And we just picked up a violin and we um, hired a tutor. And uh, I remember really liking her. <laughs> okay. I think she's really pretty. So that got me interested in, you know, starting the whole sure. thing. So you started back in when you were five years old. Right. Wow. And then it was the rest of this history. You just kept on going. Yeah, wow. it was like a destiny. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. Would you say it was love at first sight? I think... Not with the teacher, with the violin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for making that <laughs> distinction. Um, I was familiar with classical music even before I started playing the violin mm -hmm. because I listened to a lot of recordings mm. that my dad already had in our house. So I think I was very fond of classical music. But I, I remember playing the violin for the first time. I just wanted to be better mm. and I wanted to make better sound. Um, so it was a very smooth relationship. Hmm. I didn't complain or yeah, I didn't want to give up. So. I see. Sounds like your dad and his love for classical music had an influence on your, the beginning of your career. Mm. Tell us more about that, how that's influenced you. And mm. I'm the only musician in my family, but that doesn't mean that my parents don't love classical music. They were very supportive and uh, I think they wanted me to have a good musical education hmm. for some reason. So yeah, that, that's how I got started. So <laughs> mostly you went to these institutions where they teach the violin and that's how you picked up? Oh yeah, I, after that tutor, I think I started with her for about three years hmm. and then I became more serious. I started doing competitions and I got third prize at one competition when I was eight. Hmm. And that's when I realized, oh, maybe I have a chance. I should keep pursuing this. Hmm. You must have made your tutor very, very proud. Yeah, you got except to that I don't know where she is. Oh, you lost <laughs> touch with her. Well, after this interview, maybe she'll get back in touch. Yeah, Who knows? I, I hope so. <laughs> Tell us about some of the key figures in your life who've influenced you and your music. There are many people. Um, I think my parents definitely, because mm. they never told me to do anything else. And they would have been happy even if I did, you know, other things. Mm -hmm. So I, I thank them for being patient and uh, supporting what I love. Uh, my current teacher, Miriam Freed, has drastically changed my playing. Mm. When I first met her, I played for her the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. and. She brutally revealed my weaknesses <laughs> and um, kind of laid out plans for me. So I thank her for being incredibly honest. Um, yeah, I'm among many others, but sure. um, I've always had great luck uh, in meeting great people. So I, I consider my journey as very smooth and, you know, not troublesome at all. I mm. see. Mm. Now you're studying at the New England Conservatory of Music after mm. finishing your studies at the Korea National University of that. Arts, mm. I believe, right? Yeah. So how have those experiences been different or similar, your musical um, studies and experiences mm. here and abroad? Mm. Uh, when I started in Korea, I was younger, of mm. course, and I had a narrower vision, mm. I think. I think I was more concerned about how to play the right notes, how to not make mistakes, than to really explore what music is and what it means to me. Um, so I think it was a very necessary transition. I think now I'm able to share what I can share. And I you know, love music all the more because of it. Hmm. Uh, to put it simply, I think when I was in Korea, I was more focused on developing techniques. And then I realized that that wasn't enough. Um, and with the help of my current teacher, Miriam, I began to see what, what's more than that. And 
That's really the joy of being a musician, to you know, connect to a lot of different people with music. And your teacher, Miriam Fried, she's also won the Paganini competition back in, in 1968, I believe. How has that experience, having that common ground of winning the same prestigious competition, mm. helped the relationship? She was the one who encouraged me to go to the competition. Hmm. And she told me a lot about her experience. And she believed that I would do well. Um, and it turned out to be true, so she, she knew what she was saying. Mm. I want to be my teacher. There's you know, aspects of her that I really, really admire. And um, that's why I you know, have her as a, my teacher. So yeah, I think apart from sharing you know, the first prize in, in um, the Pioneer competition, I think I value her more as a person and a, a mentor who, you know, can give me advice. Sure. Honest advice. Hmm. Yeah. What are some of the critiques that she's given you that stick with you, that make you mm. want to become a better uh, violinist? Where to begin? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's a long list. Yeah. When I first went to Boston to study mm. with her, my main problem was um, it had to do with my right hand, mm. how I use my bow arm mm -hmm. and she had her own way of using it and she said it could vary my sound mm. you know I had a very small palette before yeah I think that was the first thing and um, from that we got into a lot of musical discussions you know there are things that I don't necessarily agree with her mm -hmm. but one thing I learned from her is that every decision you make should have a reason a legitimate reason mm. Nothing in music can be just an accident. So I became more prudent in approaching music. Mm -hmm. And it also, you know, made the whole thing more joyful because I began to see a, a lot more things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, both musically and personally, she has been a great influence on me. Right. Have you ever taught anyone? Um, not on a regular basis, mm -hmm. but I've given master class I see. and I know how rewarding teaching can be. Mm. Is this something you see yourself doing in the future? I want to, if I have the ability. I learn more than the students, I think. Mm, by teaching. Yeah, because when you teach someone, you have to be absolutely certain about what you're saying. And very often, I find myself very... Unsure? Incapable, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but it definitely benefits me, and I I believe everything has something to share. Mm. Everyone has something to share. Sure. What do you mm. think the focus will be if you were to be teaching a group of students, violinists, future aspiring violinists like yourself? I want to understand the students mm. well. Uh, I think there's a, a psychological side to it, mm. and. You know, I have to probably approach them differently. Um, they maybe all want different things with music. So I think the first step is to understand them. Now you're studying away from home. Mm. How's that experience and any interesting episodes that you can share with our viewers? Yeah, I mean, there are too many. Uh, <laughs> I like my environment now mm. because it gives me concentration. Uh, it gives me space from other things. I live alone, by the way. Mm. I l happen to live right next to a fire department, so I <laughs> hear ambulances all the time. <laughs> and the sound of the ambulance in the States is way more it's bothering loud, than... It's loud, right? <laughs> um, but I've established great personal connections mm -hmm. with donors and other musicians. I see. And that's the thing that I value the most mm. since I moved to Boston. I mm. see. If you were to stay here in Korea, I'm sure you have all the family members trying to help you out and trying to take, help mm. you take care of yourself. But yeah. since you're alone, living alone in Boston, how do you do that? How do you yeah. take care of Especially yourself? Especially being the only child. <laughs> you know, I miss them, they miss me. Mm. But I have things to do. Mm. And, you know, I come to Korea at least once a year. 
what's one thing that I must do this time around when I go back to Korea? Um, eating kimchi jjigae <laughs> or uh, galbi jjim. Mm. Or... I have friends here uh, for not musicians actually because mm. I didn't go to a music. I went to a normal middle school. I see. Oh, huh, that's very so, interesting. Yeah, I look forward to meeting my friends, uh, my childhood friends. Yeah, there are so many great things about Korea. You know, you can deliver at midnight or, sure. um, you know, it's so convenient. Tell us a little bit about your high school days. Uh, it's interesting that you went to a normal, a non-musical school because, yeah. right, then you must uh -huh. have been the odd one out. Exactly. I had to leave the school a lot to have lessons or, sure. you know, to audition somewhere. Mm. So I was always regarded as, oh, you're the, the violin guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that didn't mean that I didn't play soccer with my friends mm. or, you know, I went to Pishibang. Mm. I did all the, all the stuff that people do. Mm. Um, but yeah, definitely music was still in the center of my life. Mm. And I felt like I was walking a, on a different path. I friends. see, I see. I think it really makes you a more well-rounded person as a human being, having mm -hmm. had all those experiences other than just having one musical career and nothing else, right? Yeah, and mm -hmm. I remember having other interests too. I'm really thankful that I have those friends that I met so that we can talk about other things, other, you know, other fields and Music is just a small part of the world. But they must really look up to you now that you have reached this very prestigious rank. No, they doubt that I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> That's what friends Being do to friend, you, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, how do you take care of your hand? I've been wanting to ask forever. Mm. I love sports, mm. but there are certain sports that I can't do, you know, like baseball or basketball, because mm. uh, I have to protect my hands. Sure. Um, I once had an injury two weeks before a big concert oh, and no. I had to play in pain. Oh, no. and I, never, I don't want that experience to happen again. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> now, what is a violin to you? Very often I see it as a human being, hmm. um, someone that I can have a relationship with. Ooh. Because I think we're giving feedbacks to each other. Sometimes I have to match its sound. I, I know it sounds weird, but no, no. it's a living organism, kind mm, of. Mm, mm. So you have to be sensitive, know whether the instrument is in a good condition, um, what kind of sound it can produce today. Yeah, so I rely on it, you know, mentally sometimes. If I've had a bad day, I pick up a violin and sometimes the stress goes away. Hmm. So I, I think, I firmly believe that I'm having a relationship. So not like not having... a romantic one, maybe, <laughs> but some sort it of It is like having a fickle girlfriend. On a good day, she'll be good to you. On a bad day, <laughs> she can be a little bit demanding. It's a little more stable than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, have you ever been away from it, the violin? I have taken trips. Hmm. Without think, it? Without it, for hmm. a week or two. Two, I think. Okay. And you know what I realized? It's it's very. Um, I I become very nervous hmm. because we practice out of insecurity sometimes. You know, we we just have to have the instrument right here. Sure. Um, so that's how I'm addicted to this mm -hmm. uh, wood. <laughs> sure. But um, yeah, I think. It'll be very weird to not have a violin next to me. Uh, it's, it's become that important. Sure. To me. Yeah. Now tell us about the violin you're playing these mm, days. Mm. It's a Stradivarius mm. uh, made in 1714. It's an extraordinary instrument because it was played by Josef Joachim, mm -hmm. who was a close friend of Johannes Brahms, the great composer. This instrument's famous for him. Uh, he premiered the Brahms Violin Concerto on this violin. Wow. Uh, so I'm really lucky to have it. Mm. It belongs to, it's not mine, it mm. belongs to my school, New England Conservatory. Sure. I have it until next year. Now tell us Good. about how you take care of it. <laughs> when I go to bed, I put it right 
<laughs> beside <Next> my <laughs> head. <laughs> there is a GPS attached inside the case. Wow. You know, in case it gets stolen, God forbid. If you start thinking about the value of it, mm. you, know, you can't do anything. Right. Um, but I try my best to keep it uh, as as best condition because it's going to live a lot longer than me. Mm -hmm. You know, I want more violinists to you know, play on it. So. Sure, have the honor of playing the violin, right? Now, are there other violins that, if given the opportunity, that you would like to play? Yes. There's one instrument that I'm really interested in. It's now being played by Isabella Faust. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also Stradivarius. I think it's a little earlier than mine. Okay. Um, it has a nickname, and it's called the Sleeping Beauty. Wow. Um, what an exciting name. Yeah, it's because the instrument was locked in a closet for decades and somebody found it. Um, so what a beautiful name name. And what it, a beautiful it, story. Yeah, and the sound is also very beautiful. I so. see. Mm -hmm. Maybe perhaps <laughs> you will get yeah, to... Yeah, I really wish. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you devote to practicing and honing your skills? I usually practice three hours a day, hmm. but that doesn't include, let's say, studying the score or I sometimes read dissertations written about the piece that I'm playing. Oh. Um, I sometimes read biography of the composer. If you're talking about uh, technical practice, I do two to three hours a day, hmm. I would say. How yeah. does studying the composer and reading up on the piece that you're about to play help you better understand the music and mm. help you grow as a uh, as a violinist? I think it has to do with my attitude. Knowing that Paganini sold his instrument to gamble mm. doesn't affect my playing directly, mm -hmm. you know. I'm not going to play more fri frivolously because of it. But it just makes me connect with a composer on a deeper level. Mm. And that allows me to communicate more things. Through your music? Yeah, and you know, if you love something, you want to know more about it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how it works. <laughs> I want to know, how do you relieve stress on a bad day? I watch Netflix, period. <laughs> <laughs> so your TV is your go-to stress reliever. Yeah, and I also I make uh, my own music these days. Wow. Um, electronic music mm. or um, on my computer. That is interesting. Tell us more. What kind of genre is it? Is it rock and roll? Or? <laughs> no, no. Um, it's more like hip hop, lo-fi, um, sometimes jazz. Uh, I'm not a producer, but it's my hobby. I delight in you know creating something of my own hmm. because what I do as a violinist is, is mainly interpreting, hmm. not creating. Hmm. So I think I feel the urge to, you know create something. Yeah. Is that something you might want to look into uh, later in life, composing? Yeah, or? absolutely. Hmm. I want to explore more genres, but I want to separate classical music and other genres. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I prioritize them, but I think classical music is my main thing. And I value it so much that I, I don't want to distort it by mixing with other genres. Hmm. Yeah. Tell us about the on-stage Imoyang and yeah. the off-stage Imoyang and how they're different or similar. How much do you want to know about it? Oh, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> the more the merrier. Mm. I think I become more of myself on stage because it just feels very natural mm. now. But off stage, I am probably no different than any other people. Mm. I have friends that I hang out with. I, I eat, I go to bed, <laughs> I watch movies, yeah. Mm. Now, apart from classical music and the violin, of course, what excites you? You know, just living life. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and recently, I started doing Instagram. Wow. And I was never a great believer of social media stuff, but <laughs> now I think it's a great way to connect to people and I enjoy popularity. Mm. Um, you do? Yeah. Good, good. And it gives me confidence, and it gives me responsibility. And it's, it's great that I know there are people who like me and my playing. 
Mm. Yeah. There are lots of fans out there. <laughs> I can tell you that. And it's growing. <laughs> right, it's growing. <laughs> So you're the artist in residence for the Kamo Art Hall. Tell us about that role. As an artist in residence, I, um, I'm coming to Korea five times this mm. year to give concerts. And I get to choose my own program and also the people that I want to play with. Mm -hmm. So it's a very rare opportunity for a, a young mu a musician mm -hmm. because uh, it's very difficult to have a continuous relationship with the hall or with the audience. So I really um, cherish that because of this project, I got to establish a solid connection between me and um, the Korean audience through this hall. Now I hear you pay extra attention to communicating with the audience. <laughs> How do you do that? I question myself why I have to play this piece or whom I played for. Because without asking that, I think the music is meaningless. And um, my teacher always tells me in my lesson, you, know, you tell people to buy your tickets, come to the hall, shut up, not fall asleep. You have to make them listen. Hmm. You have something to pay. So I think we have a duty here hmm. to somehow make their time worth it. And that's my main role to, we don't know their musical education level or how tired they are. We have sure. no way of knowing that, but mm. we can at least try to communicate. If your intention, your music, musical intention is honest and powerful, it'll come across no sure. matter who the audience is. Sure. Yeah. This is something I've noticed watching your clips on YouTube and you close your eyes and how does that help you feel the audience better and help you concentrate? Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I try to bring out what the music is capable of conveying. And sometimes I just want, you know, the time to stop so that we can all enjoy in that moment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, me closing my eyes or whatever I do, it, it's all for communication. Yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. Just being here and now. Right, yeah. Mm. Now, do you prefer big stages or more intimate settings? I don't think it makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. I have had concerts in a very small room and it was equally meaningful and successful as one of the big ones. Yeah. But there is a certain intimacy that a small place can bring. So it's, it's a different atmosphere, but it doesn't mean that I you know, prepare big concerts more thoroughly than others. Yeah. Hmm. I want to know, do you have a pre-performance ritual that you follow? You do a hmm. certain series of actions or steps that you follow? Let's see. I drink a lot of water. Hmm. I don't want to get dehydrated. I don't eat too much before the performance because mm. I think I focus better when I'm a little bit hungry. <laughs> I eat bananas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mostly it's dealing with um, your nerves mm. and people have different ways to deal with it. What's yours? How do you get the jitters off? Sometimes I can't, but most of the time I, it, it, it has to do with how you prepare it the concert. Mm. If I'm confident in what I'm going to play, then I usually have no problem. But when I had to record, you know, uh, the 24 Caprices live, I was really nervous. Mm. And I didn't know how to calm myself down, really. But usually, once you get on stage, there's no going back and kind of get your pace and you're able to move on. Was there a chance to do over if you made a mistake for the 24 Caprices, the recording? <laughs> this recording is based on that performance um, that I gave for the audience. I see. But, of course, we had to stitch up some parts um, for the sake of the recording. Mm -hmm. It took less than a day. And I didn't want to have a lot of mechanical 
feel. I think it didn't distort the, the actual performance. Sure. Mm. How do you want your audience to enjoy your music? You know, that's completely up to them. I think I'm giving them something to play around with. I want my performance to be a playground where people can come in, explore different emotions and, you know, leave. Mm. So I know what I like about the music I'm playing, but that doesn't have to be the thing that they like. So I, I try to be open-minded, but I think the more you're sincere about the music, the better chance the audience will have uh, receiving it. Hmm. Mm. What are some of the changes, if any, are you implementing in your music these days? Mm. Changes. I would say that I'm always open to new influences and you know new experiences mm -hmm. i think to be a great musician i believe you have to experience a lot and um, i still have a lot to experience mm -hmm. so you know regardless of my own preference i try to open my ears and you know, expose myself to different environments and I, I think when you do that your music becomes more flexible in a way you dare to try things that you know other people try mm -hmm. and you you have you gain more conviction in what you convey sure we talked about composing before but what kind of studies would you like to pursue to give depth to your music going um going forward the compositional side of the piece how the composer what's the creative endeavor that he had to go through mm. when he wrote a certain piece. I want to do that on a deeper level and I think that's one sure way to deepen my link with the piece. Mm. And you know, there are many other things that I want to study apart from music and I think those things will also um, enrich my music too. Sure. This is on a different uh, subject mm. maybe, but um, there are many female violinists here yep. in Korea, mm. including Chung kyung ha of course, and Sarah Chang, mm -hmm. and um, Clara Chimikan, the list goes on. Right. Why do you think that is? I wish I know the answer. <laughs> uh, I've heard things like um, violin is more feminine than masculine. I don't think that's true. Um, but I can tell that now there are more male violinists, including myself. Mm. I don't think it's important that there are only female violinists. I think music is for everyone and everybody can try. I'm actually grateful that I'm one of the few male violinists that can <laughs> gain more recognition. Right, <laughs> and more win over the female fans out there, right? Exactly. <laughs> Now, do you feel a sense of responsibility as a Korean violinist who's making a mark and really taking on the classical world out there? Sure. I don't think your nationality really matters when it comes to music, mm. but I'm proud that I'm Korean. I feel my blood. When I uh, go to Boston, uh, I speak English, I sometimes dream in English, and uh, I, most of my friends are not Korean. Mm but I cannot get rid of the bond that I have with Korea. And I think it's an advantage. I see it as an advantage. Mm. Um, I think there are qualities, good qualities um, that Koreans have. Tenacity or hard work. right. You know, if you hard look work. at competition results, they're mostly Koreans these right, days, right. so we should be proud of it. Hmm. Yeah. They are kicking butt, making a mark out yeah, there, yeah. right? And you are <laughs> one of them. And I think having more of you will really uh, make a difference, especially for you and the, the aspiring musicians mm -hmm. um, down the road. What keeps you up at night in terms of your music, musical journey? Oh, I have lots of sleepless nights. <laughs> not, Worrying about what? It's not just because of worries. Mm. Um, mm, I don't have much concern. I try not to think about things that make me concerned. Mm. Of course, as a young artist, I'm curious about how my path is going to continue, mm. what kind of relationships I'll make. 
I want to f find musical partners that I want to work with for a long time. So these are not concerns, but definitely the things that I think a lot about. Sure. Know. Lastly, what kind of visions and uh, dreams do you have for yourself uh, as a musician many years and decades mm. down the road? I don't like setting up long-term goals because <laughs> they never turn out to be what I think. But I always want to be a young artist who doesn't give up and um, who keeps experimenting and who's not afraid of um, doing things to get what you want. Mm. Um, so I think my future is bright. I don't worry about it. And I think my journey will continue very well. Mm. Mm. I'm sure it will. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Best of luck to you. It was a All pleasure. Right. It was a very interesting conversation I had with Korean violinist Im Mo Yang. Now we will close this interview with what I'm sure is going to be a riveting performance by him. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.